right. Yeah. Um, we usually have about a 50, 50, you know, people register and about 50% of the people come live and then the rest of them say, screw that. I'm going to watch over coffee in the morning. So, um, welcome Tim. I'm glad to have you here for our cybersecurity awareness month. And, uh, you know, last, last uh, month we talked about pen testing and this month we talked about compliance, the, the riveting tale of compliance and why should engineers care? Yeah. Which, I, I know because when I grew, when I was an engineer for like 20 years, I like compliance was the enemy. Like it was just the red tape on the crap sandwich of my day in the data center. And so um, I wanted to have you on, Tim, because there is a different story to compliance. And I think you tell it well. But first, I want to know a little bit about you, Tim, where you come from, your background, yeah. what the heck this uh, Polygon stuff is. Give us, give us the five minute breakdown. Yeah, so thank you very much for having me. I'm always excited to jump on these calls. You know, how can we make compliance exciting? Yeah, we'll get to that. I'm Tim Golden, founder and CEO of ComplianceRisk.io. We are a compliance-focused company helping MSPs with their compliance needs with three different models. Teach you to fish, peer group. We fish with you, compliance as a service. And we're rolling out the boat to go fishing. Polygon, policy documentation as a service. And yeah, I don't want to make too much of a pitch here, but you know, we just want to take the knowledge that I've been living and breathing for 17 years in the compliance space and help the next generation of MSPs build a better defensibility and better resiliency in their cyber program and in their clients' cyber program. So yeah, that's my two second spiel. <laughs> I'm going to open up with a loaded question then. What uh -oh. the heck is compliance and why? Why? Uh -oh. Can't can I just keep my server secure without compliance? Isn't compliance just a bunch of things to keep people busy? Yeah. So, you know, the word compliance gets tossed around a lot in circles, right? It can be this scary connotation. But the reality is when I see compliance, I look at like, the rules of the road, or I like to equate it to something people can relate to. Let's take football, for example, right? There are rules within football, right? Let's say no helmet to helmet contact, right? There's referees to help enforce those rules and throw a flag when something bad happens or it, you break a rule. So compliance, at least for me, and how I help the MSPs and with their clients is basically a set of standards, a set of rules, a set of regulations that, you know, businesses and MSPs should start to align themselves to and get themselves compliant. <laughs> but who sets these rules? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Depends on who you ask, right? So when you look at Europe, for example, we have GDPR, right? And that's around the whole data protection. When we look at California, you know, California has been a leader in the privacy regulations and they have the California privacy protection stuff, right? So there's a bunch of different entities that begin to build out these compliance frameworks or risk management framework, RMF. And Adam, I will warn you, if I don't quantify or qualify an acronym, you drink. <laughs> I'll go I get my whiskey. There's a lot of acronyms in this space. Yes, there and, are. And being the highly dyslexic guy, I have to continue to qualify or quantify when I use them so I don't, so I can keep them straight in my own head half the time. Yeah, you know, I kind of look at, um, you know, for the analogy space, but since we went sports here, I look at um, the compliance like the schools. Yeah. And the compliant, the different regulatory bodies there are. Like, okay, we, are you uh, Division One? Are you NAIA? Are you know where where are you? Are you um, are what rules do you observe? And so um, we're like, hey, this is how we keep the game fair. This is how we how we keep people safe. And right. our body of people says you must have a helmet to play this game. You must have a, uh, you cannot pay your people. You know, there's all these real rules. And each one of the rules has a reason behind them that is, is well thought out. A bunch of people sat around the table eating burritos and said, you know, we need to stop people from uh, sharing their passwords. Yeah. We need to make sure that everybody is aware 
of what is right to do on the internet and what is wrong. Because as the cybersecurity guy who had to look through the filters and had to build the filters, because back in the day, we had to build the filters manually, which meant that I had to look at the websites you guys in the corporate world were looking at and add them to be blocked. And man, some people just don't know. You think, although people just know what not to look at, like, no, I wish the world was that way, but we do have to spell it out. Please yeah, don't look at porn at our workplace because it's really problem. funny that you mentioned like firewall rules or content filtering, for example, right? Because you know, we do our best to try to protect our clients and protect their their employees from accidentally going to the wrong things that could potentially take them down a rabbit hole. The challenge I have with one of my clients is they work in the K-12 space and they do a lot of work in single sex schools. <laughs> so try building firewall rules and content filtering rules when you need to allow single sex in schools and phrases there there around as people are doing their research work. It yeah, I it gets really interesting. Yeah, I, used, I used to build the firewall rules for a uh, strength conditioning firm uh, in SCA and <laughs> uh there are certain words you cannot use that get do not pass mustard for a filter that are common vernacular in yeah. lifting techniques. Mm-hmm. And uh, you know, we had we had a number of problems where we we spent like a good couple of days figuring out why emails were getting blocked because of hang snatch. Mm-hmm. And you know, you have to figure this stuff out. But the whole idea is with compliance, is we have to think about this stuff. And compliance helps you understand like, hey, unless you want to sit down and really build this stuff from scratch, go find a regulatory body that has your your niche in mind yep. and start applying those to your engineering principles. What kind of firewall do I need to build and what kind of rules do I need to apply? You can just whole hail, go, there you go. You can go. <laughs> yeah, just yeah go I know. I haven't that. deployed it yet. <laughs> Do I want to write a acceptable use policy from scratch or do I want to use one that's pre-built with the understanding that this is very clear and very effective for employees to understand? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, policy, as you know, uh, quite well, Adam, policy is my dick. I've been writing them for, you know, more than a decade. Um, You know, they can be so... I could probably spend the next 45 minutes talking about policy, but I'm not going to. What I will say about policy is- This is an important topic. Is have a process, right? Because what we see in the industry happening right now is everybody Googles, you know, so-and-so template, you know, acceptable use template or password template. And they grab this thing, maybe from sans.org, maybe they bought something from somebody. They grab this file, they copy past a company name and they call it done. That is not (laughs) policy management, right? Just like with your employee handbook, for example, Mr. Business Customer, you need to have your somebody at that organization sign off and authorize, yeah, this is what we do. You need to have training to your, I mean, what good's a password policy if you don't train your end users and they don't adopt the thing, right? So when we talk about policy, it is extremely important to have a process in place to manage that flow of that document over time, not a one and done. I mean, hell, I talked to a company a couple of days ago, two weeks ago, and they haven't updated their employee handbook in 14 years. Cool. <laughs> like, I think the e laws might have changed a little bit in 14 years. <laughs> and that's the other thing comes with compliance, you know, that I, I started to learn to actually enjoy compliance. At first, I hated it. I was the engineer they suckered in, or I, I refer to it as suckered into the compliance table so we could get our NIST framework in place. Yeah. I was the person who knew enough systems across this large enterprise that I could accurately represent this is going to work, this is not, and I could help craft the control families in a way and figure out who is going to be running what. Um, that I started to see like there's a consistency that compliance brings to the table, this uniformity where you can you can count on a system behaving like this. You can count on a user yeah. knowing that mm-hmm. this was out of bounds, that they should not be doing this. And now you can, your job becomes a little bit easier mm-hmm. because now you know that when I hand off this firewall to the network team, that they're gonna build it in a way 
that meets the specs and is going to meet the requirements of the business. And that is, hey, we don't want people doing this. We do want people doing that. And yeah. it's very clear to everyone. Now we can all work together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, know, you, you make a really good point about that consistency. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to do another analogy, which I kind of did a little video a couple months ago, which was it's fall. It's pumpkin latte spice time, right? So everybody loves their, you know, spice pumpkin oh, latte. Yeah, spice right? everything. Right? And so when you go to your Starbucks or your Dunkin' Donuts or any of those favorite coffee shops, they have a recipe <clears throat> compliance framework. They have a recipe that they follow that tells them the rules, <clears throat> controls, in which they need to follow in order to accurately create that same experience. Yes. every time right compliance is no different building out documented repeatable processes gaining that operational efficiencies and having a measuring stick to know what the line is and where you need to be and what you need to you know the rules to follow yeah i mean we're undergoing our SOC 2 compliance right now it's taking a little while because there's a lot of a lot of controls to look at and our type one, you can say, like, if somebody has a SOC 2 type one, you can generally say, this person has had a code review done. Somebody has looked and seen how they make the food in the kitchen. Yeah. Um, somebody has looked through and said, hey, these employees behave in an ethical way and they do different, they do things like this. If you don't have SOC compliance, or you don't have a compliance family and you're going to do business with a company, you don't know how they make the bacon there. You right. don't know what's right. going into the sausage. It may, mm -hmm. the final product may taste good, but is your, are your, is your data being sold? Yeah. Do they have, are they being completely owned? Cause they, uh, they don't claim their inputs. You yeah. know, what is wrong with this place that you don't know about and they're <laughs> doing business with you? They have your credit card. Maybe you're giving them money. Yeah. But what is to keep you safe? What's to make sure that they are not going to go out of business tomorrow and leave you hanging high and dry. Exactly. And with MSPs, this is really important to me because most of the MSPs I work with are great MSPs. They're fantastic. They know what they're doing. And they all have this experience with this other MSP in town and they're local that isn't quite up to snuff. Yeah. Like maybe it's a single person who's just slapping things in place for as cheap as they can. And they walk away and they forget to put their backups. Yeah. I think we all have a horror story of an MSP who forgot to do backups or didn't validate we their do. backups. We do, yes. And then yes. the client was left high and dry. And then you walk in and you want to charge a rate that matters. Mm -hmm. you, you want to charge $200 a PC or a person or whatever your rate is because you've done your research. Right. You have a full team that is backed. You're able to keep your client secure. Mm -hmm. But the client just sees that, well, this other guy's willing to do it for $120 a PC. That's, yeah. that's $80 a, a system per savings. Why would I go with this person? You're doing the same job, right? Mm -hmm. And you say, well, okay, so here's the deal. We observe CMMC or whatever MS, an MSP that your, your MSP observes. Yeah. So we are open about this. And if you like this, go with us. You get, a, you get, a, you get to right. know that an independent third party has validated that we are actually doing the um, at least a bare minimum according to this regulatory body. Yeah, you know, you mentioned SOC 2, and it's really interesting because a lot of MSPs, when they talk to vendors like ourselves, one of the first questions that we get are, are you SOC 2? The reality is you're probably asking the wrong questions. Well, SOC 2 is important, right? As maybe a SOC 3 public, right? A, a public <laughs> attestation that I can share with my SOC 3. But great, yeah, I have a SOC 2, but I only did the manage. I haven't done the whole framework of the pieces within that attestation to look at the entirety of my business. No. I just did this one little thing on these little pieces over a short period of time, maybe 90 days, and I got a little badge of honor. You're, as the MSP, you're probably asking some of the wrong questions. When I, I, I see this a lot in the vendor space. In fact, we were just having a conversation earlier today. You know, a, a potential client asked, do we have a SOC to report? Well, yeah, I mean, I'm in the throes of development. I'm too early for that today. But because I have built software applications that have been FedRAMP moderate 
authorized over the years, I kind of know where I need to get to. So not only did they ask for a SOC 2 report, but then they sent, you know, this whole like long, like point that I'm trying to make is that as an MSP, doing your vendor due diligence is obviously important, but, you know, connect with people like Adam and myself to ask the right questions when you're doing your vendor due diligence. But I would take that even a step further when you're working with your clients, right? Educating them and having those meetings and those appointments with them on what their regulatory requirements are. If I'm going to be an IT service provider and I'm going to work in the healthcare space, I should probably know about the HIPAA privacy laws. I should probably know about high trust. I should probably know about the safeguard rule. And I should be asking you those kinds of questions instead of give us talk to like asking the right questions is, is really where I'm getting at. So I'm going to ask that. Then I'm going to ask a question as an MSP, which compliance family should I care about? That's a really great question. You know, and a lot of people like get really overwhelmed about this. Now, what should I care about as my MSP? So I'll put my MSP hat on for there a minute. Know. Because you know, flip I'm it still, around, put the MSP on. An MSP, right? And I so, gotta right. start somewhere. Right. There's there's my MSP, right? Vital Tech Services, right? So, as an MSP, a lot of the varying control frameworks that live out there today base their roots in NIST 853. Now, we decided back in 2006 we're going to start with 853 Rev3, and we're just going to keep going. However, as a new MSP in the space or trying to get your own house in order, start with CIS. CIS is iterative. It builds upon each other across the varying implementation groups. You start right at the top. Where is my stuff? Who has it? Like inventory, hardware, software, what I call ham SAM, right? Hardware asset management, software asset management. Start at the top and work your way through. In fact, CIS actually has a free tool, their CSAT tool. You can Google it, not going to tell you, where you can actually start to build out your GRC, your compliance program based on the NIST control, uh, based on the CIS controls. It's a really good foundation. And, and, and Adam, I'm going to make a little CompTIA plug here. I'm sorry, but... Oh, you're good. We love CompTIA. CompTIA has revamped their um, uh, MSP Trustmark program. We spent the entire summer reviewing and modifying and updating and making it an iterative process. So be on the lookout in the CompTIA website for your MSP Trustmark program. It's based not only in NIST, but also CIS, also cyber liability insurance. Be on the lookout for that because that is a really good starting point for you as an MSP and me as a vendor as well. Adam, you as a vendor as well, because CompTIA, global trusted source in the IT space, right? So my two recommendations, start with CIS and be on the lookout for CompTIA's Trustmark program. Yeah, Trustmark, I, uh, I've been following that for a little bit. I particularly like NIST, uh, the NIST overview for, um, to start with because I, I was an 853 guy for years and years and years. And so I, I understood it. It was yeah. home to me. Yeah, me as well. <laughs> I, I wish I wish I had CIS back in the day, mm -hmm. but I didn't. Um, and so now we have the NIST overview, which we put in our product just because as a starting spot, but we're like, hey, should we move to CIS? But CIS is so dynamic. It's mm -hmm. a little harder to build a uh, yes, no program out of, but we do recommend. It is a great place for you to start. Yeah. And I would sum it all up with start someplace, pick something, do anything. something, start today. So you don't like you as an MSP want to bring that value add to your business. Yeah. Look at a platform like Humanize IT and see what's in there to be able to help do the work on yourself. Yeah, I know. I get it. You need paying clients, time, money, all that stuff. But start someplace, start today pick a framework and go. Uh, Tim Schnur was in here just a minute ago and he said that they have a SOC too. You can only see it in a data room after an NDA, one person only. <laughs> <laughs> True, right? Yeah, I mean, it, you know, it's so funny because 
you know, I'll, I'll digress for a second. So talking to an organization that has a NIST 800-171 or CMMC requirement, and they will only work with an organization that has an RP, registered practitioner, and an RPO, registered providing organization, designation. Now, if you've been following the CMMC ecosystem for the last several years, RP and RPO, kind of dead. What you really want is a CCP or a CCA, but they're asking the wrong question because yeah. they heard some thing, some place, and it's stuck in their head. So us, Adam and myself, our job is to help educate you, not just in the compliance frameworks, but how does it relate to the business reviews and how you're working with your client? Yeah. And so I want to tackle something here because there is a strong tie between the profitability of an MSP and the level of compliance understanding. A mature MSP, we're talking like OML3, OML4, operational maturity level three, fours. They yeah. have a process, as, as Tim was saying earlier, on how they get the job done, how right. do you make the sausage. Yep. And when you have these standards, you're able to repeat quality work. Exactly. And then when you have a process, you don't need to have somebody who can invent things from scratch all the time. Mm -hmm. Now you can hire more process driven employees, but as well, you can guarantee better SLAs with your customers. Now, on the flip side of that, now that you've got the operational maturity out of the play, you can now go to your, um, your, your customers and you can say, we observe this level of compliance. This is mm -hmm. how you know we're the best. Yeah. That's why we charge this extra 40% off of a break fix shop because we have a level of maturity that they yeah. lack. Are you ever taught you? So, so you can bring up those horror stories about people like, you know, sometimes somebody forgets to validate backups and your customer, <laughs> goes, what is, what is validation of backups? Well, sometimes it looks like your backups are running. You, know, you see the green check marks are going, but you got to restore and you got to go through a process. How do we know we have our data and it's safe? And we right. all have the horror stories sitting there going, I cleaned up a mess a couple of years ago where they lost three years of data and I used every trick in my book to get it back, but it cost them two weeks of time. Yeah, you know, we had a similar instance, a local veterinary clinic here that got hit by that VSA, that got hit by that our evil ransomware and basically lost everything, like decades work, worth of a family run veterinary practice, all internal on their machine. So no cloud system, all internal, yep. no backups. Like their IT provider said that he was doing backups, but never tested them. They weren't immutable. They weren't offsite. They just weren't done. Right. And so that's one of the things like in Polygon, what I'm building in our SaaS platform is have a disaster recovery plan, have a backup policy or data retention policy. And then align that to a process so that you as the MSP are reminded to go do a thing on an interval. We'll create a ticket in your PSA 30 days out. Hey, I'm supposed to redo this because my document says I'm going to test, like actually test my backups every quarter. Well, I write the thing and I forget about it because I did that copy pasta and threw the Word document away, but Ooh. never actually put in a process to manage what I said I was going to do. You gain that operation maturity by having the tools and technologies to back up that process. Yep. Right? You have the trust of a, of a customer. And, and then, I've heard this from a number of my business associates when they, when they talk about IT or IT security, say, well, who's watching the watchers? True. And he say, that's where compliance comes in. I know you guys hate HIPAA. I know you hate CIS and you hate, you hate those control families, but yeah. that's who's watching us. Yeah. If I don't observe a certain level of excellence. I lose my certification. Mm -hmm. And that's important in the MSP role because when you see that one man shop who is doing break <laughs> and have no quality control, they can, they can promise to be just like you and they can charge just a few dollars less and have massive margins until they crash and burn. And then you're over there doing a great job. You've got a solid system. You, you, are, you are sitting there going, hey, you guys need this. Uh, here's my recommendations for making your business excellent. And the client goes, why? I mean, that's a whole bunch of money we weren't spending last year. And you say, well, according to best practices via cite your compliance initiatives here, 
you need to have these things in place. And here's yep. why. And you can go down the rabbit trail to explain to them, you know, redundancy and you can give them horror stories on why things don't work. But every one of the control families, doesn't matter which compliance family you're using, every one of those controls has a purpose. They're yep. trying to stop something bad from happening or trying to keep something good continuing to happen. Yeah. So you, you and I chatted a little bit beforehand. I talked a little bit about my view about compliance and, 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 and making the analogy as, you know, compliance is just the security referee, right? And, you know, one of the things that I shared with you was- More to that it I, than that. That Well, yeah, it is way more to it than that. And, you know, I'll drop this in chat if you don't mind. Uh, one of the things that we talked a little bit about was if it's not measured- then it doesn't get done, right? So you beat, you beat me to it. <laughs> I, I, I kind of figured you might be going there. If it doesn't get, yeah. So like with the backups, if you don't validate, did it happen? Yeah. You want to see an engineer move fast, tell him you're going to check the backups. Yeah, exactly. If right? you want to see a business move on something, say, hey, we're going to go ahead and validate your, your acceptable use policies, your yeah. NDA. You're going to immediately see the 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 attorney log in and check the and make sure the NDA is up. Yep. And you know it's really interesting because you know when we look at our clients and even ourselves, like we take this word compliance and it has this major like negative connotation to it. But the reality is is that we are being compliant in many other areas of our business. Right. I'm sure we're just not letting funds transfer in and out of our account with no checks and balances. I'm sure we're doing things around 2FA and passwords and other things within our business. Right. So when we look at the word compliance, I hate that it gets such a you know bad rap because literally you're doing these things in other areas of your business. Now we're just going to apply it to some of the technology pieces, some of the process pieces. Like it is literally the same thing. Like you have an employee handbook. That HR person is going to walk through that onboarding of that human, right? They're going to get their uh, healthcare set up. They're going to get their, like, th there's process for that. There's things for that. Those are all compliance things, in your business, in every business, regardless of what business you're in, you have these things in place. You and I, Adam, we're just, you know, we're taking it to a sort of different area of the business that at large people aren't used to thinking about yet, but they will be forced into it. Insert cyber liability insurance reference here. <laughs> yeah, and because I, I see people say, oh, it's a compliance is just a checklist. And then I hear people say, how do I become best in class? And I'm like, stop treating your compliance like a checklist. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, start engaging with compliance. It's there for a reason. Yeah, like, yes, it is bureaucratic. Yes, it is dry. But it's there because it's getting you to think about things that maybe just aren't at the forefront of your mind. Mm -hmm. And because you now have this measurable thing that you need to look at once every three years, once a year, once a quarter, once a month, now mm -hmm. you are getting and ensuring that things are happening. So in our, in our company, we, we observe EOS, we do traction. We love traction. Exactly. And so every week at our, at our meeting, we have a series of metrics that we have to report on. And those are the things that we verify every week that we are doing and that either we're going up or down, whether it's a bad story or a good story, we know the story every week and we can yep. adjust our company to it. And so we have picked our metrics to be <laughs> compliant with. We have where it's green and where it's red. We know when we're going down south. We know when we're doing uh, like a marketing campaign is doing really well. Mm -hmm. We know when we're on goals, when we're off goal. We can see something coming ahead of time because we can see how engagement's working. And because of that, if we didn't do that, it would just be like, oh man, why are customers coming in all of a sudden? And yeah. I go over and I say, well, sales has been doing a big marketing campaign. We should be ready for this. Make sure that no one's taking vacation right now. Exactly. This is our own form of compliance. But on top of that, we are going through SOC 2 and we're taking it seriously. Hey, when was the last time we did code validation? Have we checked our inputs? Oh, there's some old libraries. We should get rid of those. Mm -hmm. And those are things that as an entrepreneur, normally we like, I ain't got time for that. 
I'm in the middle of a build phase. I just want to get things out. But just want to get things says, out. No, no, no. Yeah. While you're at it. You need to go to Veracode. You need to submit, run a scan, and you have it independently independently um, looked at so that you don't gloss over it while you're trying to do really cool things. It's really interesting because I was literally just talking about Veracode and SonarCube this morning with the dev team. Like we run a couple of those tools, like developer edition tools on our code base. Like, I mean, I mentioned before, I've been building FedRAM moderate authorized apps for the federal government for way too many years. So I'm a little bit ahead of the curve when it comes to building that kind of stuff, because I kind of know what to think about and what to look for in software development lifecycle. But that doesn't really apply to MSPs, although there's an exception. Are you writing PowerShell scripts? <laughs> Are you putting those PowerShell scripts inside your RMM that have you know, elevated privileges that can do things to machines and heaven forbid, thousands of machines at once, like being able to look at your code as a, you know, your PowerShell scripts as an MSP and know that you like, you didn't just find some random thing off the internet, copy paste and assume it's going to work, right? Having some kind of framework, some kind of test, some kind of development process that says, yes, this PowerShell script is appropriate, works well, you are writing code, it is a scripting language, and you could de definitely destroy stuff if you're not paying attention to that along the way. That's where compliance can kind of come in, right? That's where tools like Veracode, SonarCube, and all the other things that Adam mentioned as far as doing some code reviews can be really helpful to protect you. And you back up 10,000 feet and you can tell your client, hey, listen, yeah, we script stuff, but we have a whole team or a whole process in place to make sure that the scripts that we're running wasn't just some random thing I found on GitHub to do something I wanted to do. We tested, verified, and then rolled it out appropriately. And that gives you the competitive advantage, you know, to, you know, one man paper hanger that copy pasted something off the internet. Yeah, the, the checkbox security people. Checkbox. And I, I want to also like impart some wisdom to the group here and have Tim comment on this as you will. The the idea that chaos is the enemy in mm -hmm. IT, in engineering as a whole. Chaos is the enemy. And I know because I, I was what we call a triage engineer at this, mm -hmm. at this uh, large corporation I worked with for a long time. And my goal was to take chaos and organize it. And right. when we see major cyber attacks happen, they happen during chaotic time. They're waiting for a blizzard. They're waiting for you to be off kilter when you're saying, oh, well, let's just forego our security right now just so we can get the job done. They're yeah. waiting for those moments, whether it's a natural disaster, a political disaster, um, some major world event that's distracting everyone. That's when the attackers come in because they know that people are being as lax as possible on their um, best practices because they're just yep. trying to get their job done. Well, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not going to name any vendors, but, you know, back up to that 4th fourth, fourth of July weekend where literally thousands and thousands of people got nailed by this our evil thing, right? Like they took advantage of a long holiday weekend here in the United States where a lot of people probably are not sitting, hovering over their computers, but out celebrating with their friends and family, right? they take advantage of those moments, not just in chaos, but known entities like, hey, uh, Thanksgiving's coming up. Who works Thanksgiving week? Uh, well, I mean, I do because I can get stuff done because the staff aren't working, <laughs> right? So actually Thanksgiving week, Christmas week, and, G and New Year's week are my best weeks to get stuff done because nobody's around, right? But from, you know, from a threat actor, like they look at those, not just the chaos events, but the known events where people are less likely to be having eyes on stuff. How does that relate to compliance? Well, if I followed a framework and that framework says we're doing these things on this interval, doesn't matter whether it's 4th of July weekend or chaos event, we are monitoring and maintaining and following the rules of the road to make sure that the car drives safely down there and people get to their destinations. Yeah. And that is the beauty of being an MSP that observes compliance. You can charge more because you are doing more. Yeah. And maybe not necessarily doing more because you're more efficient. Your operational efficiency is up. Mm -hmm. And that's not everything. Don't get me wrong here. I know that one of the top things right now is operational efficiency. 
Yeah. That's only because it's really lucrative for us vendors to uh, capitalize on, hey, we can make you more operationally efficient. I've been using that term for two or three years now. I'd love to see that it's getting traction. <laughs> oh my God. Operational efficiency. Uh, it was, uh, not, I think at ConnectWise IT Nation, it's like 39% of MSPs can, can care about it as a number one issue. Yep. Um, and operational maturity, uh, operational excellence, and trying to make things better. And you should. And if you want to charge the same thing as, as professionals do, those recommended margins that they have, mm -hmm. you've got to have a mature MSP that is observing some kind of compliance some kind of best practices. So you can go to your client and say, this is why we charge $200 a device. Right. Because we are best in class per C certifications here, people backing us up and seeing what we are. Right. So, so you know, you'd be able to look at an organization you want to do business with and say, man, are these, is this bank FDIC? Yeah. Would you ever do business with a bank that wasn't FDIC? Probably not. <laughs> <laughs> no? Would you walk into a clinic that claim that says, "Hey, we're a doctor clinic," but there's there's no there's no MD there. There's yeah, no or or no like there's no sterile there. process. Like my wife is a nurse. Let's talk about all about processes in place, right? She works in the operating room, and literally yeah. every single thing has a documented, repeatable process. <laughs> Not just because of the efficiencies, but because heaven forbid you should show up on Gray's Anatomy and have a, you know, a needle left inside of you, <laughs> right? Not only do they keep make you more efficient, but they make you more safe and secure down the road. I want to back up, right? Because I want to be cognizant. We have, what, 15, 20 minutes left. You know, the title of the the title of this was, you know, geared towards engineers, yeah, right? I'm, I'm so I want to, to I, like, why does this matter? I want to bring this back to as an engineer, right? So I'll back my truck up, you know, probably a decade or two as an engineer in the IT space, right? I spent many years being frustrated with not having a process to follow, not even knowing that I needed a process to follow and really bashing my head against the wall. And what do they say, you know, about, about idi idiocracy, like doing it over and over again, right? So, but I mean, if you look right there on my wall, if it says, if I have to do something more than twice, I script it. <laughs> and I've been living by that mantra for probably decades, right? Not just scripting a thing, but having a process in there, right? As a T1, you know, level one engineer, right? I'm going to have, hopefully, in my MSP, my, you know, T3 and executive leaders, they're going to give me or guide me on how to onboard a client, how to offboard a client, how to do a password reset with a client. All of those things, hopefully, your MSP kind of has some of those things. Compliance is no different. Right? How do I build a How do I build a, a a disaster recovery plan? How do I prove that that plan is actually working? How you know ensuring that my end users know what to do in in the event of an incident through our incident response program? It's the same kinds of things that you as a T one tech have been doing all along. It's just a different discipline, not a big scary one, but just a different discipline. It doesn't have to be scary. It just has to be done. Yeah, and it and measured. And so measured. That point. And that's and that's why you need to be able to go to your client and they say, why should I follow your recommendation? And the client and you can tell the client because control family AM to uh says best practice is to inventory all assets and ensure that they are covered under a war manufacturer warranty. Yeah. Or out of compliance on these 16 items and we need to replace those. Mm -hmm. This isn't your advice. This is NIST. Yeah. 850 yeah, well, degrees, right. United States government. <laughs> right. Back, back, back it up and look, just look at the auto industry, right? Like, why do we have seatbelts? Why do we have airbags? Why do we have warning lights? Like going all the way back to like the covered wagon days where you're bouncing through the prairie and you don't have a seatbelt and you fall off and get run over. <laughs> yeah, right? I remember when seatbelt laws came out in Nebraska and everybody's like, ah, oh, I don't need to wear yeah. seatbelts. You can't tell me what to do. I can't breathe with them on. I mean, everybody had every excuse. Oh, yeah. I mean, the car, the, the, the car and, that but I nowadays, drove. Nowadays, everybody's like, you have to have a seatbelt. Yeah, the car that I drove at 16, 15, you know, when I was getting my license didn't have seatbelts. <laughs> Like fast forward, like 
I would never let my child in the car without double strapped five point harness, like, you know, and it, you know, <laughs> helmet, you know, puffy airbag, like, because we've learned, we've learned. And right? people say, well, kids survived back then. Yeah. Just not as often. True. You know, there's a reason why we tell people don't wear a fluffy coat while on a five point harness. Yeah. We have rules behind this now. Yeah. And it's not a rule, but maybe it will be in a couple of years. We say, if you put a kid in a down coat inside a, inside a car seat, it's child endangerment. That might be a rule that comes out someday because we saw that that fluffy coat invalidated the harness. Yep. And kids, kids, kids have passed because of that. Yep. And that's why we have compliance. That's why we say, now you need to have this kind of seatbelt. Hey, you need to look out for the sinks. We know you care about your child. Mm -hmm. Same thing with your business. We know you care about your business and you've never had one of these bad things happen. And we right. want to make sure that these bad things don't happen to you. And here are some rules to follow to ensure that. Now you can say, ah, it's a bunch of crap. I don't need two factor. It takes too long to log in. Well, you've been told. Right. It was your, it was your decision not yep. to do two factor. And mm -hmm. when somebody decides to use your servers as a porn right. hub for illegal activities, yeah, that's on you now. It you boils down to the, all that lost time, yeah. which happens. I have cleaned up many networks where they said, oh, well, we just don't want to observe these rules or we just don't care because we're not a target. And right. I say, well, There's... actually, I just did a deep dive on your server and you've got about 36 gigs of porn of various types on your server that is going out to 26 countries. Yeah, and that's the thing now. Like... So it, it's <laughs> about risk appetite, right? And yeah. so, you know, we do That's this in our business. Term. We do this in our business all the time, right? I'm in New Hampshire, kind of high on a hill. I don't really care about flood insurance. But if I was in New Orleans or I was in Miami, I would probably care about flood insurance. That being said, I do have hurricane insurance. I do have nor'easter blizzard insurance, things that cover those disasters in our area insurance. i'm in a double landlocked state i don't need that <laughs> right but you know those in miami you're probably never going to get a blizzard right so i mean the point that i'm trying to make is the mm -hmm. risk appetite for me is different than the risk appetite for adam for anybody else but at the end of the day making those business decisions against some kind of standards yes. help me as the business owner, help you as the MSP through a platform like Humanize IT to be able to have that conversation with your client and help them understand their risk appetite. Do you yeah. want to eat a little? Do you want to eat a lot? Or do you just don't want to eat at all? Fine. But that's, you know, that's what this all boils down to when we talk about compliance as it relates to, you know, technology and cyber and, 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 and those kinds of fields as well. And, and that is an excellent point. Risk appetite is the core of engineering because mm -hmm. it's easy as an engineer to dismiss things like, well, we don't care about that because we're disconnected or blah, blah, blah. You can come up with an excuse. That's great. But the whole point of having a risk a compliance family is it, it shows you the landscape <clears throat> and then you can decide whether you want to mitigate, defer, or accept the risk. You have options. You don't have to mitigate everything. You don't. In Nebraska, I'm not going to mitigate hurricanes. I'm sorry. Which, no, it's, it's, which it's, was it's, odd because we had an inland hurricane uh, in 2019 and they, <laughs> they, they couldn't call it a hurricane, so they called it a... Um, Cyclone. It was or a something. cyclone or a, uh, something bomb. Half of it, so it was this big vortex that came over Nebraska and it circulated. Yeah. And half of it was a blizzard and half of it was a tropical storm, essentially. Because wow. we're sitting there and we get we flooded and broke several <clears throat> days because of the pressure of this storm. Right. On one side of Nebraska. On the other side of Nebraska, we lost so many head of cattle due to freezing and death. Right. And this happened. And how do you insure for something like that? And we all assumed it wouldn't happen, and then it right. did. And right. so now we, even <clears throat> years later, are still cleaning this up. And that's yeah. a natural disaster, and that's just something you have to deal with. But you as an engineer can look through this control family and say, which of these apply to my client? Now, here's the broad spectrum. We're going yeah. to cast the big net, and we're going to see which ones do we really care about. And you as an engineer now can make recommendations based upon the security families and you don't know that broad net and people like Tim can really help you figure that out. Like, Oh, you're in, you're in Maine. Here's some of the control families you should care about. 
These are the should be top of mind for you given your locale. Oh, you're in the financial industry. I highly recommend you look into these control families and we start here with these compliance initiatives because they're the ones that are going to most likely save your customers ass. Yeah. So sorry, I keep snickering because I don't know if you can see my dog. I see a tail. I see a tail wagging and going. She's like, she does like the dog circle dance in her bed and is just being, she's, hey, I'm on a webinar. Stop it. (laughs) But so let's circle, let's circle this back, right? So yeah, natural disasters. I want to talk about something that happened to me when I first got into this, right? Scared, you know, 20 something year old looking at this giant framework of all this stuff and totally flipped out, spent the better part of a year digging into everything. Nothing existed on the internet back then, by the way, everything that I had to learn, I actually had to get out of these three ring binders. Now, we went through our first bed ramp um, uh, security validation. We thought we had everything done and everything great. And we did. We were doing really well. At the end of it, they obviously had some findings. Do you know what one of the findings was? You have no documentation around flooding. Flooding doesn't happen here where I live. I mean, yeah, it does. But like, as an engineer, when you look at these frameworks, yeah, they're going to scare you. But there's people like myself. There's people like Adam. There's probably some of the individuals here sitting on this webinar on LinkedIn. Like, this isn't my knowledge to keep. We are a community. That's what I love about the uh, IT profession. Like, we work together. You don't know? Ask. The only dumb thing is the one not asked, right? We are here to help, to grow, to share so that we can all gain more operational efficiency and protect our clients better in the long run. Just because you're new into a technology role at any organization, IT company, MSP or not, these are things that you can start to learn and start to build build upon in your own knowledge base. There's a community here around you. You don't have to be afraid. Compliance is not a dirty word. That's my next tagline. You don't have to do it alone. And you don't have, that's my next tagline. Compliance is not a dirty word. I love that. (laughs) Well, I think we spent so much time doing checkbox. Like as an engineer, you you get to the point where like, all right, fine. I'll do do that. Oh, I got to upgrade my my, uh, encryption. Oh, I got to encrypt all desktops now. And you don't sit down and think of the why and really understand the behind it. So from yeah. an engineering standpoint, understanding the why of the family will help you sell to your client better, will help you find better recommendations for them that are more relevant to their needs. Yep. And as well as it makes, it stains you apart from the competition in your local area. Yeah, Everybody the why, just the why behind it is, is really important to understand. And that just takes time to learn and to understand and to reach out to other individuals in the community help to help you understand the why, right? Why do we, why does everybody harp on 2FA? Because it works and it's annoying. <laughs> yeah. You should try doing it across multiple different devices. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like I was just trying to log into Hulu last night because my kid wanted to watch a show and I was like, crap, which phone is that going to? <laughs> you know, but like, you know, I want to end with these, this, this concept of, of, you can do your job well, but if you use compliance, you get to know you're doing your job well mm-hmm. and your clients know you're doing your job well. Yeah, It's easy to work in ignorance. Mm-hmm. It is simple. You can feel like you're the best engineer on the planet, but unless you have somebody like Tim or a compliance person looking at you and saying, are you doing a good job? How do mm-hmm. you know? How are you measuring your success? Well, I earned more money this today. Okay. That's today. How do you know over time that you're going to do well? How do you how do you measure yourself? What's your outside mirror? And yes. that is compliance. It's not just a checklist. Find a body that you believe in and adhere to it. Yeah. Find a mode of excellence <clears throat> you can measure yourself against and say, this is who I am, and this is the level of excellence we adhere to. Yeah, you know, just empty that's- words. That's- That's the thing, like checkbox compliance is dead. You know, copy pasta, you know, policy templates are dead. I keep saying this. I've been saying it for a long time. But 
It doesn't have to be hard. It doesn't have to be scary. Even as a level one technician, all the way up to a level 10 or 12, like doesn't, doesn't matter your level of expertise. As you start to understand the why we do a thing, you'll actually start to embrace it more, <laughs> right? Why do we do security awareness training? You know what? Now I don't have to like reset people's passwords all the time because they now understand they need to have a strong password and that they're keeping their stuff safe and secure. Like, oh, it just takes something off my plate so that I can go learn something different down the road. And the thing is, you can also pass on this compliance. So you, you've got yourself, the MSP. You've yeah. got your clients who are you are bringing to a new level of excellence. And then they have their clients who they can now say, yeah. we are best in class. You are safe with us. And now they're willing to pay you more money because you're making them look good. And yep. we'll always win in life making other people look good. Exactly. If you, if you help your clients look their best to their clients, that person will never leave you. Make them the hero of their story. Use compliance. Say, here's why you're going to be the hero. This is why you're going to be excellent. Exactly. Tim, thank you for coming on. This has been yeah. really, really enjoyable. Um, compliance for engineers is a different is a different angle on things because we have to talk about why should an engineer care. And exactly. I hope everybody does understand why you should care now. And I hope that this helps raise the bar just a little bit for mm -hmm. us out there on um, being operationally mature. Yeah, Adam, thank you so much for having me. I know we've had a couple little tangents here and there, but listen, as a T1, you know, level one, level two technician, or even level three, like it doesn't have to be scary. There are resources that are out there ask we are all a community here to help and the more i can help you the less i have to do it in the long run <laughs> right so, mention, there's some amazing tools out there <clears throat> polygon that will make it easy and help you understand what you're doing yeah. and doing thanks. thanks for that yeah so adam always a pleasure thank you so much uh we we'll look forward to our next one am i going to see you at it nation you will see me at it I'll nation right in Sarap alley we're going to have our unicorn shirts on and everything nice. Nice. Well, I'm looking forward. Best of luck to you and the other Pitch It contestants. Um, ah, they don't need luck. I'll be rooting They're for actually you. good. I have to work at it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll be rooting for you. I'm really excited to see your pitch. Don't be afraid on stage. I'll be in the audience heckling, or at least I'll have a bottle of bourbon waiting for you. Oh, oh that'd be appreciated. <laughs> All right, we'll talk to you later, Tim. Thank awesome. you. Good luck. Thanks. Bye.